today we are talking about uh, how measurements, uh, specifically air quality measurements, and also touching a little bit on human body temperature measurements. So how these uh, measurements can uh, safely return to, can help you safely return to the office environment or the school environment uh, or any other, you know, indoor building environments. So uh, to begin with, uh, my name is Tuam Sredekšnja and I am responsible here in uh, Soft Technica for the marketing and business development of uh, of the uh, RNet brand. And uh, this webinar, as with all of our webinars, uh, it will be uh, displayed in our YouTube channel. So for those of you uh, who who can't make it, who couldn't make it, the webinar will be available later on. I know that there's a there's also a um, public holiday today in in US, so perhaps uh, some of our US colleagues cannot join. So you'll be able to see it afterwards. So I guess um, no, with no more further ado, we can uh, go into the presentation. So uh, just to start off with kind of like a bit of a uh, philo philosophical um, standpoint. Uh, why do we why do we even measure? So um, there's this great uh, good quote from uh, from a last century scientist uh, William Thompson, or more commonly known as Lord Kelvin, uh, and he said uh, that you can only improve what you can measure. And uh, this is this is the same for the case with with COVID. So everybody is thinking about uh, making offices and, and places a lot uh, safer. Uh, but to actually really understand uh, how to make them safer, you have to understand what is your current position. And once you are doing things to increase this safety, you kind of also uh, have to measure and, and have something objective to tell by uh, that your efforts are being, you know, have been worthwhile. So uh, starting off already, as, as, as mentioned uh, beforehand, the main, the main focus uh, of this presentation uh, will be regarding air quality. Uh, because when we started inviting people to this uh, webinar, uh, a lot of people asked for the uh, the focus to be on air quality, as this is uh, a quite hot topic. But of course, there is also the aspect of uh, of, of human body temperature measuring, uh, which is also quite prevalent uh, in these in these strange times. Right, so. Uh, let's start off uh, by asking, so maybe not all of you even know, um, why is it important to, to you know, monitor air quality uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the pandemic? So um, it got quite a lot of uh, media attention in, 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 in recent months specifically in June and July. Um, you know, Nature uh, published uh, a piece on it, Time magazine, uh, the New York Times. Uh, and the main kind of idea here is the fact that uh, there's a growing body of evidence that is suggesting that uh, COVID is being transmitted not only, you know, in, in big droplets uh, as as you know, is the official state of the World Health Organization, but also via aerosols. So these are uh, small droplets um, that you know are released when we talk, sing, cough, do things like that. So, um, but you know, we know that the media tends to over. Uh, 
overstate these things and especially in this um, in this covid environment uh some 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 things have been you know pushed that uh, might should have not been pushed uh, as strongly before and there's a lot of things that we don't know so there's a lot of misinformation out there uh so what we are going to do today is actually look at uh, some of the articles some of the science that has actually been done uh in this regard what they did what they saw and uh see how that affects some of the conclusions and see how that can be used you know to to ensure uh a safer return to office so at any point uh feel free to ask questions in in this uh in this questions box that some of you already used to help me uh to help me solve the audio issues and uh i will try to so at at each point that i conclude uh, a part of the presentation i will try to answer uh the questions right away because uh the information might be a bit dense so but we have planned a, a q a at the end as well so um so to give kind of a broader overview what are the uh, transmission uh routes of of covid19 or um, sars cov2 which is the virus that causes uh, COVID-19 uh, illness. So the classical ones are direct contact and droplets. So large droplets um, are typically uh, 500 microns across. Uh, they uh, typically travel around 1.5 meters. So this is where these um, these guidelines of of keeping uh, two meter distance uh, comes from and uh, uh of course there's the d direct contact route and another one that has been um, has been increased uh, increasingly uh, receiving attention is also the fecal oral route but the one that we will mostly focus on today is the airborne um the airborne route so uh firstly what 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 i want to look at is a uh, study done um recently uh which 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 was publicized in the lancet uh, respiratory medicine so uh, what these researchers did was uh study the uh, distribution of uh, of different uh, of different droplets uh caused by you know coughing uh, talking, um, you know, any any interactions that people do, and what they found out is that uh, typically you see uh, quite uh, quite two distinct, uh, let's say, types of droplets. So um, there's there's the uh, ones that I already mentioned, the which which are approximately 500 uh, microns across the big droplets that are typically uh, released during cough and then uh, another the other ones are of course these um, these small droplets and the uh, important thing to note here that uh, these are the only ones that are uh, being released during during speech right so during speech large droplets are not released so how 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 does that happen and uh, what what are the implications so what they studied is um, essentially uh, they monitored how long uh, do these um, first of all large droplets uh, stay in the air and then from that uh, inferred how long should the small ones, so the, the aerosols, stay in the air? So uh, typically um, filming the large droplets, they uh, concluded that uh, the time of 
time spent you know in the room time spent in the year is around uh, one second and you know based on uh, you know um, from one side Newton's gravity from the other side air resistance uh, they calculated that uh, the small droplets stay stay in air uh, for about nine minutes so that was the theoretical part then what they did was to try and uh, compare how this actually happens in real life so essentially um, they used um, they used a spray um, this specific cold med spray which generated five micron particles uh, to actually uh, have this uh, repeatable the uh, repeatable size and repeatable distribution of these uh, particles and a uh, spray scan laser sheet as you can see on on that image uh, that actually counts the amount of droplets and investigates how uh, how long time did it take for the amount of particles to halve in the air so after how long uh, was the uh, particle count reduced by half so essentially what they found is, uh, and they explored uh, three different scenarios. So the first scenario was a room without ventilation and closed windows and doors. Uh, the second one was with ventilation, but still with closed windows. And the uh, third, uh, the third kind of um, room where they investigated this was with uh, full-on ventilation and with open windows right so what they found out using using their um, using their um, method is that in this worst case scenario uh, these uh, particles remain in the air actually for five minutes so theoretically they calculated nine minutes which is a bit more but still five minutes is quite significant so that means in a room where which is poorly ventilated uh, somebody could have been talking there five minutes ago he could have left already you have no idea that he was there and you come in and these uh, COVID containing uh, particles are uh, remain in the air now in the other uh, room where there was ventilation turned on uh, this, 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 um, these particles remain in the air for 1.3 minutes. And in the most ideal case with windows open, ventilation turned on, uh, the half life of particles staying there, uh, was only 30 seconds. So that is a significant decrease, um, decrease tenfold from the most, uh, from the worst case scenario uh so um yeah so i see that there is one question regarding any info about singing in a choir i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly so um they didn't specifically investigate you know singing but what they what they did mention is that you know it's it, it is the sim similar thing right so if if these particles are being released when you're talking you can be sure that they are released you know whilst you're singing because you know singing forces more air out and with that uh, more of the uh, particles right and uh, regarding these aerosols there is uh, one more issue what we have with them is that um, the conventional uh, surgical masks uh, that are typically you see people wearing actually stop only 30% of the small aerosol droplets. There are masks out there uh, that uh, can stop them all, but they are, of course, you know, uh, high quality, more expensive versions. So uh, it might not suffice to, to just wear a surgical mask and be protected uh, from this. So, uh, taking into account uh, these studies and, and, and others, the um, European uh, 
Federation of uh, Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Associations uh, has published several documents uh, regarding uh, practical recommendations for building services operations. So uh, there are two main documents released. Uh, there's one which is the general guidance document which is released on August 3rd and then there is a uh, another document which is uh, specifically uh, for school buildings. Uh, I would recommend everyone that's watching and, and interested in these um, and you know making office spaces more secure um, during this pandemic actually look up the whole document because it's very informative but the main kind of points that i want to focus on here is uh what they kind of recommend is of course increasing air supply and exhaust ventilation um of course that will increase the energy budget of the building that you are operating or that you know anybody is operating uh, but in this case, you really do have to you do have to look more for the safety aspect, and sometimes that will take extra cost. Uh, of course, you know even if you have nice ventilation uh, put in place, as we already saw in this uh, experiment, you know whenever possible, use also openable windows. Uh, with this, you can't have you know too much uh, too much ventilation. Uh, a very important part here is really avoid air recirculation. So what does that mean? Uh, typically, you know the best way uh, for for buildings to be ventilated is to actually have all the time uh, getting these um, these this air from from outside. And you know, there's essentially the the air is always should be always changing. Whereas uh, in the case, uh, what you see in several offices that have you know these small conditioning units, they don't actually pull in the air from outside. They just recirculate and cool down the existing air. And the case here is that this type of uh, a system is actually worse than no ventilation at all because it is recirculating the same air that has been there already and if there are any contaminants in the air it actually uh, keeps it longer there and doesn't let these mm, doesn't let these uh, virus containing particles to settle on surfaces so that having a um, a recirculatory ventilation system is actually uh, worse than having a ventilation no ventilation at all anyway uh, and the last kind of thing is actually to monitor these this air quality monitor how fresh the air is monitor the quality of uh, ventilation uh, via co2 sensors so why CO2 sensors? Well, uh, CO2 is really a, a nice proxy to use as a um, air quality measure because we are all producing CO2. So we breathe in oxygen, breathe out CO2. Uh, and as everybody knows who has been, you know, in a crowded room and where if there is some kind of a uh, CO2 monitoring device there, or even if not, you know, the CO2 buildup causes uh, you to feel like, you know, there's there's little air there. Um, so it's a nice indication whether or not this, this air is being exchanged properly. Uh, so uh, typically um, the same uh, federation of um, of heating and air conditioning uh, has come out with guidelines that this um, that this air uh, circulation should be around 60 uh, cubic meters uh, per hour per person, which is twice as much as your uh, typical kind of recommended air circulation, and this 
uh, this this kind of um, equates to approximately 800 parts per million uh, CO2 concentration. So how do you measure that CO2? Well, in uh, recent years, it has become a lot easier with the advances of uh, non-dispersive infrared sensors, which has allowed um, to create um, to create devices like we did as well um, RNF4. Um, these uh, this is a portable and you know a portable device which uh, can sit neatly on your table that uh, measures uh, CO2, which is mainly the big number over there. Also does uh, temperature, relative humidity, and air pressure. So uh, it comes with a nice and easy to use smartphone app for viewing for viewing data for viewing the co2 data um, also for 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 changing settings and and things like that uh, but what it also has and what we have as a capability and especially if we're talking about uh, larger spaces where we're talking about you know um, offices schools universities wherever you know, you suspect to have more than just one room. Um, you want to be able to follow all of your spaces, all of your rooms, everything. Uh, so you'll have probably more than a single device. So this is why uh, we have RNet as a total uh, complete wireless sensor network. So the way it works is that you'll have uh, these sensors. Uh, which are, um, you know, wireless CO2 sensors, and they can, and there's a base station, which you see on the left-hand side over there. So they are send, the sensors are sending the data to the base station uh, via the 868 megahertz or 920 megahertz in the United States uh, license-free frequency. And this allows for a super large distance from the base station to um, to the to the sensor, so up to even several several hundred meters uh, in you know office uh, settings and and uh, and all of that. So you can have different uh, presentation, uh, different uh, transmission intervals, so different intervals when the device is sending the data to the base station, so one to five or ten minute intervals, and you can have up to hundred sensors per base station. So this is what really allows this, what really allows these uh, the solution to be. Uh, scalable. So if you have a large school, if you have a large office, uh, typically, you know, 100 devices might suffice and you can have all of that uh, centrally connected to this base station uh, to, you know, view data, graphs and things like that. And all of these sensors have a uh, two-year battery life. So uh, the way that it would look is you have this uh, base station in some central location and having you know this uh, large range you can uh, get the data uh, from you know uh, many locations and the base station comes together with a built-in server and actually uh, software which we call sensor hub and that software comes for free so you can uh, connect to that base station directly you know um, with your pc tablet or uh, smartphone the uh, base station also functions as a wi-fi router and it has it is a, it essentially has a uh, web server built into it for viewing data directly from that base station and uh, it also has capabilities uh, 
to integrate into um, you know existing solutions, existing uh, existing systems and databases. So going back to that uh, CO2 question, uh, there are uh, several other you know aspects to consider regarding CO2, not only regarding CO2 monitoring, not only you know this uh, COVID-19 safety, but actually what recent studies before the pandemic have shown us is that you know increased uh, CO2 indoors has the potential to to, to cause some uh, health problems and also cause some productivity loss problems because this is a relatively also a new problem right because uh, nowadays over the last 20 30 years people have been uh, increasingly uh, increasingly let's say um, thinking about energy efficiency and they have been you know making buildings more energy efficient you're putting in you know plastic windows closing all of the uh, holes uh, and if you don't think about proper ventilation um, this co2 buildup becomes a real problem because back you know in the old days when you used to have wooden windows there used to be you know holes in in in, in different places um this air circulation kind of wasn't that big of a problem but nowadays it actually has become a severe problem and besides you know as an indication for you know how how viral particles uh are being ventilated out um there are other you know aspects and uh you know one of these aspects uh was was studied by researchers from harvard in uh, 2016 and what they did is actually take a uh, batch of 24 healthy inv individuals and over the course of five days they exposed them to varying levels of co2 and in this case uh, they gave in each each of these days they gave them um a cognitive test uh they were playing a strategic uh, management simulation or commonly known in the industry as a business game so this was a computer program slash game uh that was this this designed to uh, specifically uh kind of um, evaluate uh these participants uh, let's say cognitive abilities on different domains. So in this um, graph, you can see kind of uh, the 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 total overview of of what they looked at and how that was affected by different CO2 concentrations. So essentially, you know how how well people. Uh, look for information, how they uh, make their strategy and things like that. And what they found was actually quite shocking. It was that uh, when the CO2 concentration goes up to uh, 945 parts per million, uh, your cognitive abilities drop by 15%. So, however, if you know, uh, this this uh, CO2 goes up to 1400 the cognitive abilities drop by half so just think a little bit about uh, what this implies so if you have you know your workers your employees that you are paying essentially for their knowledge work so for their uh, their application of cognitive abilities inside uh, you know your organization how much does it cost you that they are sitting in poorly ventilated spaces and going further on top of that uh, we actually have uh, we actually have um, now mm, this, these these uh, studies uh, that have shown what happens uh, what happens in a uh, person's brain 
uh, when he, he or she is exposed to uh, varying levels of uh, CO2. And what they found is that uh, actually the uh, neural activity uh, goes down and uh, the metabolic rate of, of the brain also goes down. And also there's a decrease of uh, between regions of the brain. And quoting one of the uh, authors of, of, of the study, is a, it is as if you, know, you have this, this, this um, state of the brain when it's exposed to higher levels of CO2 is actually as the same as looking at a very tired brain. So this is typically something uh, very uh, different than what you want to uh, see in you know in a in a workplace. And uh, to kind of give a comparison, we actually when we first came out with this uh, this product. We did a small test in one of our meeting rooms over uh, over two months without, you know, really uh, making much attention to that. So, uh, and looking at how 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 much time is being spent in this uh, this 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 fifty uh, percent. Uh, cognition level versus you know 15 percent and versus to you know fresh air and uh, over this period we calculated that you know because typically in a meeting room you'll have around two to three people then over uh, over this period of two months uh, an average 1.5 uh, employee salary or employee cost to company was lost due to low cognition. Um, and of course, afterwards, you know, taking that into account, uh, opening windows when the situation becomes critical, actually, uh, actually solve the problem. So the question is whether or not I see one more question. Uh, can we get the presentation later on? Of course, this presentation will be made available. Uh, it will be probably put on the RNet forum. So um, those of you that don't know, we do have an RNet forum. So all of the previous uh, presentations uh, are available there and this one will be as well. So going further, the same thing can be said. Also, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, research coming out suggesting that even uh, apart from COVID, there's uh, increasing evidence that CO2 affects the immune system, meaning that uh, having spending time in higher CO2 environments. Uh, actually is bad for your immune system. So not only uh, just this, this um, uh, not only just these uh, places for for actual virus particles, but actually for, for to ensure that you know your immune system is is operating correctly. Um, and also, it's worth looking at other parameters uh, in terms of you know um, in terms of monitoring the um, this 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 um, microclimate quality and one uh, parameter to actually take into account is humidity so uh, relative humidity is also important um, to to monitor uh, to ensure that your immune system functions properly because low uh, humidity dries the mucous membranes in the nose and throat. So anything below 40%, especially now with the winter coming and you know a lot of heating being turned on and low humidity resulting from that. So uh, it shouldn't be less than 40 percent and actually having a too much humidity also you know as you probably know comes with 
a whole host of problems regarding you know formations of molds and, and other things that are also quite bad for the immune system so uh, the recommended humidity level is 40 to 60 percent so uh, this kind of concludes the segment regarding the microclimate uh, regarding the microclimate part so we're going to move on to uh, the human body temperature before uh, before uh, before we go on further let me see if there are any other questions so are all the pictures reusable referring to reusing pictures on our website where we advertise um, RNet4 um, I will double check that, but most likely the answer is yes. But I will double check this and, and, and get back to you. But if there are uh, if there are no other questions regarding uh, regarding this um, air quality part, I'll move on to human body temperature. But if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in. Yeah, so somebody uh, somebody wrote that it's important to distinguish between CO and uh, CO2. So that's David who wrote. And that is a very good point, David. Uh, sometimes people do mix these things up. So what we exhale is CO2 and not CO. So CO is something that is created uh, if, you know, there's... Uh, if if you're burning something, so this is CO is carbon monoxide, which is kind of created at the when when um, something is burning and it doesn't have enough oxygen to burn, and CO2 is that part uh, is is you know the the gas that we ex exhale. So thank you for mentioning that. I hope. I hadn't, uh, I didn't have it uh, mixed up in the slides somewhere beforehand. So, um, with COVID arriving, um, one of the symptoms of COVID-19 is having this elevated body temperature. And as probably most of you have noticed, a lot of public spaces, a lot of offices, also here at SAF, we are regularly measuring temperature, body temperature of anybody you know who comes in or yeah, so you see that in, in, in quite a few cafes and in some shops as well. Uh, so what is what is the human body temperature? So well, uh, there there is a um, important distinct, distinction that we have to kind of make is that there are two human body temperature. There is one which is the core temperature, so your real inner body temperature, which should be for a healthy person, 36.6 uh, degrees centigrade. And there is the temperature of the uh, shell, or so to say, your skin, which is kind of let's say this um this layer in between your you know outside part and inside part and that uh that shell temperature uh does not always represent correctly the real temperature of your uh core body right so um but the thing is that most measuring devices in fact all of them that are not invasive uh, more or less measure the shell temperature so it is important to kind of understand uh, these differences and important to kind of understand what do you need to make a correct uh, measurement so uh, the human body temperature we each have our own one and it depends on a lot of you know aspects like age, uh, the time of day, uh, your physiological processes, whether or not you've had any physical activity, uh, and other things. So it is not constant; it differs throughout the day. So these are all things that you know you have to keep in mind. 
so how to measure uh, as you've probably noticed most places um, that have introduced uh, regular you know either employee or visitor body temperature measurements use infrared contactless thermometers so this is a thermometer which uses infrared radiation to tell whether or not uh you know not whether or not but to tell what is your uh temperature typically uh that will be pointed at your uh forehead and it will tell the um temperature the surface temperature of your forehead so this is also something that really only looks at uh at the surface right so uh, the other option of measuring temperature is contact thermometers and you know the most popular one that you probably know and have seen is uh this uh, mercury thermometer or i think now in uh, european union it is actually illegal to sell them so they use um they use something else they look similar but they don't work as well as the mercury one and with this uh, covid pandemic you know um, going across the world what we realized when it first started is that we can actually use our platform use our iot wireless sensor platform uh, to actually um, make these contact thermometers and make a wireless solution for them so essentially what you have uh, are thermometers as you see on the right hand side right, right hand side over there uh, with probes these metal tips on on their ends and uh very similar to uh, as what you saw in this uh, rnet 4 case uh, up to 100 of these devices can be uh, connected to the rnet pro uh, they transmit the data once every minute once every five ten three minutes sorry two minutes and essentially you can give one of these out to each of the employee of of employees or you know wherever you uh, require you know this uh, this measurement um they can also be of course disinfected between you know uses of different people and you get a nice also um report afterwards um, you get all of the data of you know all of these temperatures day you know day by day so uh, using the rnet pro device so once 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 we released this this solution uh, we started off by offering it to hospitals for uh, patient body temperature monitoring then we realized that there was a lot of interest from places like uh, nursing homes as well where they wanted to you know especially for um, you know to monitor uh, their population which is their resident uh, temperature uh, who are typically you know at a higher risk than 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 others and also uh, a couple of workplaces had interest in this so what we decided to was to actually do an experimental comparison of uh, how does the infrared thermometer uh, compared to the rnet contact wireless medical thermometer and what we did is um, for a span of for over a span of two weeks 65 um, employees participated in, in measuring uh, the tem temperature and this is uh, after you know gathering all of the data uh, this is what we saw as a um, distribution of of temperatures so as we already kind of explained beforehand um, temperature for each person is you know a bit different so your uh, ideal uh, body temperature 
uh, is, is, uh, might be different than your person next to you. But typically, we would want to see this uh, average population uh, measurements in around 36.5, 36.6 degrees. And this is how it compares to the infrared thermometer. One thing you, you really uh, see right off the bat is the fact that the infrared thermometer consistently shows a lower temperature. Um, this is due to the fact that, as you know, as you, as I already mentioned, as I already mentioned, uh, that uh, this this infrared thermometer is uh, is monitoring, uh, is viewing the temperature of the surface, and the surface. Uh, Typically, might you know you might have a sweaty forehead, forehead, or you just walk in uh, from outside, which means your you know your skin your is 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 colder than your internal uh, than your internal organs, right? So that temperature will not will be shown lower than. Uh, than this, um, than than your actual temperature is. Whereas with the contact thermometer, you can uh, actually measure it inside of the armpit, which is the closest that we can actually get to measuring this internal uh, temperature. Because you can close your arm, and that, let's say, uh, gets you as close as you can without invasively, you know. Um, measuring the temperature and the other thing is the fact that um, the fact that the spread of the measuring points is quite wider for the infrared thermometer but then what we did was actually to compare uh, the readings of the medical thermometer to the readings of infrared thermometer and to our surprise we saw that the correlation between the data uh, does not exist. So what you see here over this uh, over the spread is on the uh, y-axis. You get uh, the same for the same person this the same measurement with the infrared thermometer for that day, uh, and on the x-axis you see the Aronet medical thermometer. And there's very weak correlation. It should be on that you know red line, but it's not, which just goes to show that uh, the the uh, correlation uh, between these thermometers is is, is very low. Effectively, uh, analyzing literature for for other research that has done similar things um, with contact versus you know infrared thermometers, we find same conclusions. So, uh, very weak correlation between contact and infrared thermometers. Uh, and the infrared thermometer is a lot more affected by this um, by by the environment. So, in conclusion, these uh, infrared infrared thermometers are a lot more poorly suited for human body temperature monitoring than uh, contact thermometers. So, uh, this more or less concludes uh, the part of the human body temperature. Um, monitoring. Um, so, just to kind of wrap up uh, some conclusions that that are worth reiterating. One of the main things is that you know air quality should be considered. Uh, you should consider air quality if you want to have you know safe operation of your offices, schools, and other indoor spaces. Um, a good proxy for telling whether or not you know there's sufficient air quality uh, is CO2. So effectively, the measurements are very important. Um, also, human body temperatures, temperature measurements are important to ensure the safety, and you know contact. Uh, contact thermometers are the best option for measuring. So um, a great solution 
uh, for this for these problems is the RNet system. So as already said, you know it is a industry leading wireless sensor network. So uh, you can actually have um, both of these systems operating with the same base station as we have, uh, for example, you can on our website uh, at case studies, you can uh, see an example where where both uh, the air quality and the human body temperature measurements are done for this uh, for a elderly home in in, in Italy. Uh, so um, you can check that out. Um, of course, uh, we the main kind of focus of the RNet system and the main let's say idea of uh, when first creating it was uh, to make it a simple as simple as possible so a plug and play system uh it is has an industry leading radio range comes with free software um with graphs reports centralized alarms so you don't have to pay a subscription fee to use the the, the basic software which is on the base station and then of course you can upgrade to a cloud solution which allows for multiple location multiple base station support and things like that and it allows of course for um, integrations with existing systems and databases so uh, going back full circle and returning you know to this uh, to this nice quote by lord kelvin uh, of course, you know, in um, a lot of these places, especially when we are talking about air quality and uh, things like that, you know, the most ideal solution would be to create uh, ventilation systems that are able to, to, to exchange air properly. But that is typically, you know, a large investment and not many places are prepared to do so at least those that haven't yet implemented it. Uh, so the first step, at least to go in the right direction is using these measurements, using devices like, you know, the RNet4 uh, to ensure that you kind of, you can at least see how bad or how worse, how, how, how bad or how good is the situation and how, you know, how how can that be changed at least by opening a window when it becomes too critical so this more or less concludes the presentation i see that we are almost perfectly on time we've ended three minutes early i see two questions would you recommend using more than one co2 sensor in one room if the number of people surpasses a certain number uh, typically what we see with you know co2 sensors is that if we're not talking about very huge rooms, then one per room should suffice because especially if there's people there that are breathing, that are moving around, um, that really creates diffusion, uh, which means that this uh, CO2 is being circulated around. And in general, you know, it's, it's quite hard to make a ventilation for a room that you know half of the room is ventilated and the other half is not ventilated so uh rather than having you know several co2 sensors uh i would try to make sure that the co2 sensor is you know placed correctly and what do i mean by that well for one that nobody is directly breathing on it so because you know your breath has uh, a higher quite high concentration of co2 so for example if i breathe directly to onto an rnet4 device it by the, the next measurement it maxes out showing 9999 parts per million that is uh, one thing to consider uh, but also not putting it, you know, too high upon the wall or upon the cupboard. Typically, you know, you want to keep it all at a level uh, where where people are usually. So, so you know, either on the wall, uh, hung by, you know, this 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 nail, 
uh, which you can place on top of it or on your table, but you know, not right directly in front of you. When there was a more, uh, let's say, clarification uh, regarding the, the question 30 people versus 15, 60 people. In that case, if you have a place that is uh, housing 50, 60 people, in these, you know, larger cases, you you can use another one to at least, you know, to verify that 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 everything uh, is all right. But uh, but typically, in most cases, one per room should suffice. So somebody said that they found a lot of interesting info here. Uh, thank you, Giuseppe. Any plan to make it run on 433 megahertz? Yeah, so this is the uh, the frequency band that has that's that's used in Asia. Currently, we don't have uh, a product that that supports it, and it's not at least in the uh, next year planned because we are really busy with a lot of different you know new sensors and the cloud solution for the RMS. So I would say having it in 433 megahertz is not really our top priority right now. That being said, we are of course very much opportunity driven. So if you know a an opportunity presents itself uh, of you know significant size uh, that is contingent on creating a device uh, in this uh, 433 megahertz, band then then of course we will do it but we have not yet received you know there has been some interest but nothing too serious yet so we have currently we have other priorities but you know that might shift of course what would be the minimum order quantity if we have a project to run on 433 uh this is not something you know that i can answer off the bat right here yeah i i will probably consult the r d to, to to find out the associated costs and then we can uh, we can kind of figure this out and i can uh, respond to you later uh regarding this but this is a this is a very good question. Thank you for asking. I'll uh, I'll be sure to check and get back to you, Mohammed. There's another comment uh, running 920 on our country. It's possible, but won't be legit. So of course, it's very important to to have this uh, to respect these uh, law transmission laws. So so yeah. How is the supply situation currently? Yes, yeah, so um, what a lot of people have noticed and uh, one of the things that happened with all of this uh, craze of regarding COVID and aerosols and, and CO2, uh, what actually happened is that we received, you know, too high of a demand that we weren't actually expecting for th these devices. So. Uh, essentially, in, in a matter of a couple of days, we sold out uh, and with the current situation, uh, it's also quite difficult to uh, get parts if this is not planned accordingly. So we had this quite, quite, quite big of a mishap uh, regarding uh regarding the availability of of our four devices uh the situation has uh let's say become a little bit better uh of course we are uh we are giving top priority to our net four pro devices um so i would suggest for anybody who is specifically interested regarding this availability to con contact your uh, respective uh rnet uh, sales manager and he will have the most up-to-date information of, of of the current availability and how much is is possible to order at this stage but we are really ramping up 
our production and we expect to you know increase uh, this maximum output uh, significantly in, in the coming months. The, the questions are getting more uh, more more interesting. Yeah, and, and, and I see somebody even laughing in the uh, comments. So no, unfortunately, we cannot label uh, our devices 433 uh, and sell you the 920. <laughs> that would be uh, very illegal and would cause us potentially a lot of uh, problems down the line so unfortunately uh, we cannot uh, we cannot risk this um, reputation of, of soft maybe Mohammed we can uh, we can we can uh, contact uh, contact you after after this uh, webinar to see you know uh, what is what is the situation with this opportunity and how large it potentially is uh, and maybe we can you know prioritize this if it's actually really significant to have it in 4 420 it's time for to wrap wrap it up uh, thank you for uh, the nice words everybody who's saying that the presentation is nice um we are planning on having another uh webinar by the end of september as well uh follow-up information on that will follow as i already said this recording will be available on the uh youtube channel of aranet also in this uh in this our forum and uh, well i want to wish you all to really stay safe um you know it is a uh, large pity that the situation is that it is, as it is but you also have to be maybe a little bit opportunistic and you know find all of these um you know places where you can use this, this this technology and you know hopefully using rnet can actually you know really help with the situation and really uh help uh to increase you know employee safety um you know and let's 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 hope for the best so i wish you all good evening or from though for those who are joining us from the states good morning and uh, see you in the next webinar bye